This morning we will start a new book, 1 Peter, so if you'll turn your Bibles there, and we will look at verses 1 through 2. And the theme that I've given this book is to the pilgrims, and we see that in the first few verses. So let's read the first few verses, and then we'll start with my normal introduction. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatea, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithia, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit in a, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Wow, there's a lot in those two verses. And so we're going to really dissect First uh, Peter and hopefully interpret uh, what these words mean to us today. Let me give you a quote from Peter. Now, the context of this quote is Jesus talking about riches and wealth and how hard and how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, how we are to give up everything. You remember that rich young man that Jesus came to and he said, you need to give away everything because that was the thing that kept him from coming to the Lord. And the Bible said he walked away. Because he couldn't do it. He couldn't sacrifice the thing that God said to sacrifice and follow him. And then Peter said this after seeing this whole scenario. We have given up everything and followed you. What a beautiful quote by Peter. To quote Peter is pretty amazing. Because Peter is an interesting guy. I I like Peter. I think of all the apostles, Peter is my favorite. Paul is awesome. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But Peter, for me, is important because he reminds me so much of me. You know, I'm kind of like Peter. I don't get it right all the time. I'm always struggling with things. I don't understand what God is doing at times. And so me and Peter, we kind of relate with one another. And so we're going to talk about Peter today. The book of 1 Peter is basically a general epistle. We would call it an instructional epistle or a, a motivational epistle. It, it encourages us to do certain things. He will instruct us as believers. So it's written to believers in general. And he will instruct us how we should live in this world. And Peter has a lot of experience in living for Christ, because he made a lot of mistakes in his walk with Christ. He authored this book right around A.D. 60, so about 28, 27 years after Christ resurrected uh, from the dead and ascended unto heaven. And so he had about 28 years to really think about this little letter that he writes to the pilgrims. And then he pins it down with such great passion and 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 as a teacher and as a pastor and overseer of the church and an apostle with a heart to really equip the saints for the work of the ministry. He spent from 33, from 30 to 33, when Jesus walked this earth, three years with the Lord, learning and being trained for the ministry. In this book, we have key players like Peter, Silas and Mark. Mark was a young man that Peter touched tremendously. Mark pinned the gospel of Mark through the words of Peter. And so in a sense, Peter dictated that gospel. Its purpose was to encourage suffering Christians and to call them to personal holiness. Peter's central focus is to is persecution like in the book of James. So these are Christians, early Christians that were being persecuted in the early church and Peter is encouraging them to stay holy, to stay focused and to continue on with the Lord. I like what John Corson writes about Peter and the time of Peter. He says on July 19th, 8064, Caesar Nero set fire to the imperial city of Rome, determined to stamp out uh, his, his image upon the new Rome. Or stamp on the image of this this new Rome. Caesar hired arsonists to destroy the old one. Uh, The ensuing devastation gave him justification to rebuild structures like the Circus Maximus. Seating over 100,000 people. 
the existing Circus Maximus wasn't big enough for Nero. So he had it burned along with most of the city and then rebuilt it to give 300,000 spectators the opportunity to witness sport events, gladiator bouts, and eventually Christians being thrown to the lions. Due to the immediate suspicion that Nero had a part in the fire, Nero knew he had to quickly find a scapegoat. He convincingly found one in the Christian community. It's not that I who burn the city, he said. It's that it's these who speak of the unquenchable flames of fire, coupled with the abuse of misconception that due to their observation of communion christians were cannibalistic and combined with the fact that because christians stress love and purity that they were a threat to the rampant perversity of the day the populace was eager to blame christianity for their crumbling families and charcoal capital city Consequently, only a month after Peter's epistle was written. That's what's happening today. During the time of, of the Roman Empire, they wanted to rebuild, and so they burnt it down, and then they blamed the Christians and said it's their fault that it was burnt down because they're into purity. They're the ones keeping us from enjoying life. And isn't that what's happening today? A lot of times... If you talk to an atheist, they will tell you it's religion that's keeping us from evolving to the next level. It is Christianity with all its commandments, all its rules, all its obligations that's keeping us from enjoying life. And they blame Christianity. And that's the time that Peter is living in and the persecution that is taking place. They literally would take Christians. Nero would take them and he would light his his garden with Christians. He'd put them on poles stick poles up their bodies and then light them on fire to persecute them. He would take Christians and he would take the, the belly of a cow or an animal. He would cut them open, put the Christians in there, sew the animal back up and then throw them out in the arena. So they let the lions loose and the animals loose and they would devour the Christians along with the, with the other animals. This was the type of persecution that was going on. Nothing like the persecution that we go through. It's interesting because we haven't seen persecution here in the United States. There is persecution happening in other countries, beheadings because of their faith in Jesus Christ by the Muslims and so forth. And in fact, more Christians are being killed today than ever before. But here in the United States, we're spoiled. We don't see that type of persecution happening like in the times of Peter or in other countries and other nations. We're spoiled here. You know where most of the persecution comes for the church? In the United States, within the church. It's within the church itself. It's by believers attacking other believers and struggling with other believers. That's where usually the persecution is at. You know, because we're so selfish and so self centered at times. In these chapters, let me break them up for you. Chapters 1 and 2, Peter addresses the issue that believers are to live a life of personal holiness as God's people. Even during times of suffering and persecution, he teaches that all Christians are to expect suffering. We're to expect it. And if we're living for the Lord, we will have persecutions come to our life. Though we don't want persecutions and we don't like them. He teaches that all Christians are to expect this type of suffering, that it becomes normal. Peter explains that our salvation in Christ is an election by God and that he took our sins on the cross for by his wounds you were healed, he tells us in 1 Peter 2.24. Then in chapters 3 through 5, Peter explains that in living holy lives, the believer is to sanctify Christ, verse 15 of chapter 3, as the Lord in our heart, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And so we are to give a defense for the hope that's in us. That is, share the gospel. Defend the gospel with those outside that are persecuting the church. A part of living a holy life is obeying the commandments of Christ. And Peter claims that we are obligated to preach the hope that is in us. He expounds that believers should not be surprised when persecution comes upon them. Be on the alert, he tells us. 
in 5 8 because we have an enemy satan who's seeking around to devour us he talks about satan also if the believer does suffer persecution they are to glorify god they are to entrust their souls to him and him alone an outline could be given we see peter praises god for his grace he talks about putting away wickedness He talks about relationships between a husband and a wife. He talks about living for Christ and being partakers of his suffering. And so if you are a believer in Christ, then you will also partake of the sufferings of Christ. Then he talks about elders who feed the flock. And he has a passion there when he talks about the elders and the bishops of the church and how they're supposed to be feeding the flock with the word of God, just like Pastor Chuck did. He really loved the Word of God, and he loved teaching the Word of God. And he taught that uh, to his people. I saw one interview with uh, him, and I think it was Greg Laurie. And what he wanted to do with the Young Hippie Movement was to let them know that they could do the same thing. And so that's why he purposely taught so simply through the Bible. He picked a book. He went chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and he just shared, simply sharing the Word. And and when Greg heard him say that, he says, you know, it's funny because I would sit there and listen to you. And, and I thought to myself, I could do that. <laughs> you know, I could do that. And so Chuck encouraged those under him, you know, that you can do it. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to go to seminary school. You know, you don't have to be a college graduate. You can just simply teach through the word of God. And when you really look at the book of Acts, and that's where Chuck gets it from, he, he, he chose... He saw that Jesus chose 12 men, and these men were not educated men. They didn't go to the rabbinical schools. Uh, They didn't go to college. They were fishermen. They were political uh, anarchists. You know, they were tax collectors. You know, they were just common people that all of a sudden fell in love with Jesus and then wanted to share that with Jesus. And Peter was just a fisherman. He wasn't educated at all. Maybe that was some of his struggle earlier on. And his words and talking with Jesus and others also. And so Chuck took this truth and this passion for ministers and so forth and, and said, you can do it too. You know, and Peter's doing the same thing here. Uh, also, he talks about the young, the youth. That is uh, that age group that's, you know, uh, I would say 30 and under, maybe even 33 and under. The younger group that they're to be obedient to their elders. That's something we don't hear a lot of today, obedient to elders. Um, We struggle with obedient to elders because we're taught in this world to be free thinkers, right? Uh, To be uh, an individual that thinks for themselves. And that's wonderful and that's great, but it should always be in light of what Scripture says. Always. So let's get into these verses and break them up for you. We have Peter's introduction, verses 1 through 2. So we have Peter. Well, let's talk about Peter. There's an interesting name, Peter. I like that name, Peter. The name is used more in the Gospels than any other disciples of Christ, except for Christ alone. Peter is used more than even Paul's name, which is interesting. Peter's name is mentioned 210 times throughout the New Testament, where Paul's only mentioned 160 times. So Peter's name is very important to the Lord. He was God's right-hand man. He became one of the apostles that was the leader along with James and with John in the early church there in Jerusalem. It was Paul that came to Peter for advice along with Barnabas concerning the Gentiles. And so Peter is mentioned more than any of the other disciples. In fact, putting Paul and the other disciples together, Peter is mentioned even more. Peter, Latin is Petrus with a U.S. and the ancient Greek is Petros with an O. He died in 64 or 67, somewhere around there. Uh, He is also known as Simon Peter. Uh, You may read the name Cephas, which means Peter also. The name Peter in the English spelled Petros in the Greek. The gospel describes Peter as coming from a fishing village in Capernaum there on the Sea of Galilee. And so he or his father or his family owned a fishing company. And that's where he grew up. If you can think of a fisherman and how they grow up, uh, he probably went to school, probably uh, learned from, you know, whatever teachers were around in that little community, you know. But 
most of the time he was out fishing with his dad. His dad would take him out there and, and teach him the trade of fishing and how to fish and so forth. And then here comes Jesus and, and begins to speak to Peter. And Peter is just so amazed at the words of Jesus. He falls in love with Jesus. And then Jesus gives that call to come follow me. And he drops everything and he follows Jesus. And the gospel is clear that he was a native there of Galilee. Peter and Andrew, his brother, were fishing by the Sea of Galilee when Jesus called them, born in Bethsaida. And then he left his net to follow Jesus. The Catholics suggest that Peter became the first pope. I don't know if you've heard that before. And that the word rock, meaning that God would build his church upon Peter, and so he would be that first pope that would take place and rule and reign over the church and thus the popes from that point on until this day. The only problem is that Catholicism didn't come into play until the first and second century. And so that can't be true, nor does the Bible say that he became the pope or a pope. He was an apostle, and he'll say that uh, in the opening statement himself. Uh, Peter is an interesting character. Whenever you get a chance, read, read Mark and read the Gospels and read about Peter. I mean, he's just one of these guys that you fall in love with because he, he's, he's relatable. You know, you read his life and you just go, wow, he's kind of like me. You know, he's kind of like that person, you know. And yet you see how much God really loved Peter. Peter was always with Jesus wherever they went, whether it was Mount Transfiguration or, or whether it was, remember, they asked Jesus, uh, you know, pay his taxes. They didn't have any money, so... Jesus told Peter, go, go, to, go and fish, and the first fish you catch out, you know, look in its mouth, and there's the money for the taxes and so forth. So Peter got to experience some, some wonderful things with the Lord. Uh, we can experience those things, too, when we spend time with the Lord. Those experiences are, are there for us. But we need to desire them and want them. We have to spend that time with the Lord. That's when it comes, to, to have this superficial Christianity where, where, hey, I go to church on Sunday, so why isn't some miracle happening? Because it's not about going to church on Sunday. It's about every day getting on your face and praying and seeking the Lord, reading His Word and praying, asking God to do some great thing in your life, to use you, you know, to humble you and, and to take you to places that you've never been and things that you've never done. And it's, it's a matter of really devoting yourself totally to the Lord. You know, I get the pictures, the monks, you know, they got the idea, though they made it into a, a religious act. But they got the idea just separating yourself from this world completely and just seeking the Lord. That's when you find the Lord in, in miraculous ways. Uh, I personally have done that many, many times and have seen the Lord do some great things. And so I know the Lord and I love the Lord because the Lord's in my life and he's using me and, with things that I've never thought he would even do in my life. And so like Peter, I might not be the best, you know, but I love the Lord and whatever the Lord wants to do, I'm available to do it. As I said, he was a fisherman. He loved Jesus very much, but he would also get into trouble quite often. Jesus had to rebuke Peter uh, more than any of the other disciples, though he's talked about more, but most of those times it's because he got rebuked more than the other disciples. Uh, I was listening to Raul uh, the other day, and he was talking about Pastor Chuck, and uh, he was just, he's, he, he's an emotional guy, as you know, very emotional guy. There are times where you listen to him at a conference, and he starts crying for the whole 45 minutes, and you're just going, what is he doing? And then people get up and get saved. You know, it's just amazing how the Spirit's on him. But he, he talked about Chuck and how Chuck has taught him, and he's in that inner core. And he says, and there are times where Chuck had to rebuke me. I didn't like it. But man, he rebuked me, but he was right. He was right. You know, and that's probably how Peter felt. I needed to be rebuked. I needed to be re corrected. Peter was the only disciple that, that dared to rebuke Jesus. <laughs> you know, there are a couple of times where Peter said, You don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. What do you mean go to the cross, die? Enough? No, I don't think so, you know. There's no way. I'll take the sword and I'll fight for you. You know, it's just not going to happen. And Peter confessed Jesus more boldly and accurately than any other disciple. He was bold in his confession to the Lord, wasn't he? And yet at the same time, he cowered because he said, I don't even know the Lord. So you see that up and that down with Peter. Pretty amazing when you think about it. 
Peter denied the Lord more forcefully in public. Peter praised, I'm sorry, Jesus praised Peter more than any of the other disciples. He was at the Mount of Transfiguration, as I said to you. It was there that all of a sudden he opened his mouth and said, wow, this is so awesome. We need to make tents for Moses and Elijah. And if Elijah was there, you know, and so forth. And the father just kind of, you know, spoke, spoke and said something to Peter. And it's like, okay, there goes Peter now being rebuked again. Peter stood with the disciples after the ascension of Jesus Christ and appointed Joseph called Barnabas. Uh, with the surname Justice, Matthew as a disciple, Judas Iscariot was gone. And it was Peter who said, let us draw. And they picked Matthew to be the next apostle or disciple of Jesus Christ. Peter was the one who gave the address uh, on that day of Pentecost. And over, what, 3,000, 4, 5,000 people were saved. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter was an amazing guy. It was Peter who was later rebuked by Paul because Peter sided with the religious leaders on applying some of the works of circumcision and keeping of the commandments. And Paul had to rebuke him. And then it was Peter that later on said that that as he wrote the letter to the disciples and Paul to give to the Gentiles saying, you don't have to follow the commandments of Moses. What you need to do is just love the Lord Jesus Christ, abstain from idols and, you know, um, and sexual immorality and so forth, because you've partaken of the Holy Spirit as as we Jews have. So amazing guy. And you ask yourself, wow, because if you looked at this guy, as all of us do, when we look at people who stand behind pulpits or they are in leadership, do you think that guy would have been allowed to be a pastor or a teacher in a church today? Probably not. Do you think he'd have a lot of friends? Probably not. Do you think he'd been rebuked a lot? Probably. Do you think that he would have reached that area where people would have respected him? I don't know. Because even later on, Paul had to rebuke him in front of everybody. You know? And pretty amazing that God would still use him. Isn't that amazing? That God would have so much grace upon Peter and his personality and his character. It's amazing how God himself will take someone like that and do something with him. Speaks loudly of God's grace and his mercy towards us. Notice this next statement as Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter calls himself an apostle. Now he's not saying it in the sense to boast himself or to give himself some sort of status. What he's doing is explaining to the church that I have apostleship given to me by Jesus Christ. And as I'm writing to you, I'm letting you know that I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Usually when we write letters, we always put it at the end, right? You know, we write the letter you know, to, to so-and-so. We write it and then all of a sudden, I want you to remember who I am. So I write my name down there. I love you very much or thank you or grace you know, and so forth. At this time, they'd always put it in the beginning because they wanted to make sure that their name wasn't remembered, that what the context of the book would be remembered more than their name. And today we want to make sure that what we write, they remember it was me that wrote it, (laughs) you know, because we put it on the other end. And so Peter is saying, I'm an apostle. Well, what is an apostle? There's confusion over that. Do we even have apostles today? No, we don't. Not like the 12 apostles. (laughs) There were 12 apostles. Judas Iscariot was one of the disciples, but we saw that he went and hung himself. The word apostles is made up of two words, apo, which means off, and stelo, which means sin. A technical word used of one sent from someone else with credentials on a mission. So somebody who is sent out was considered to be an apostle. The fur Fergberg Greek lexicon gives a broad definition. One who is sent out on a mission or a commission represented of a congregation, a messenger for God, a person who has the special task of founding or establishing even a church. The UBS Greek dictionary also describes an apostle broadly as a messenger, just a messenger. The NIDA lexicon gives a very narrow definition of a special messenger, generally restricted to the immediate followers of Jesus. 
or extended to some other like Paul or other early Christians active in proclaiming the gospel message. What he is saying there is, is that you are an apostle because Jesus has sent you out on a mission with a specific task. And so there were 12 apostles. I believe that Paul was considered to be an apostle, not Matthew, who they chose. Matthew was chosen. You remember they prayed about it and then they drew lots to see who would be the next disciple because of Judas Iscariot. Well, then later on we find out that it was Paul because Paul calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ, appointed by Jesus Christ. And so God really chose the 12th apostle and that was Paul. You have probably read or heard someone say today, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. What they are saying is, is that My church, our denomination, our group has sent me out to start a church as a missionary. And so they consider me to be an apostle. They're not saying that I am one of the apostles like the early apostles at all. It's the Mormon church that literally says that. They say they have 12 apostles that run the Mormon church. Literally like in the New Testament. So who are the apostles? The apostles are basically this. And you find this in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. And this is what uh, Peter said or or, um, Luke said as he wrote. He says, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among them. So, So one of the requirements is that they walked with Jesus and they saw Jesus and they were with Jesus in and out. We know Paul did because Paul had that vision of Jesus. Jesus spoke to him and directed him and told him that he would suffer many things. Beginning from the baptism of John to the to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Paul, in writing First Corinthians chapter 15, puts himself in there as a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ also. So those were the early apostles that God had chosen. Now we see whom Peter wrote to here in his next statement to the pilgrims. That word pilgrims means foreign residents. They were residents, but they considered themselves to be foreigners. Of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatea, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethina. Peter is writing to these groups of people there in Turkey. Paul had ministered to the Gentiles and started little ministries In those places, Peter is dealing now with these Gentiles that Paul had ministered to, to encourage them in their time of suffering. And so he calls them in a sense of dispersion. You remember James said to the scattered tribes, in a sense, speaking to the Jewish believers. Peter is now speaking to the Gentile believers. But yet using the same phrase as James, you know, uh, the scattered tribes. And here's the dispersion to show us that Jew or Gentile were all part of the family of God. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And so he's getting at that point there. Therefore, he calls them, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Now, it's interesting in this last verse that we see the Trinity. The Father is mentioned, Jesus is mentioned, and the Holy Spirit is mentioned here. Uh, Peter believed in the Trinity, and he describes the Trinity very clearly in these, in these verses. So we see Peter calling these believers elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. The doctrine of election. Difficult doctrine to understand. There is so much debate over it. And in fact, there is a lot today that is happening with this doctrine of election. Calvinism versus Arminianism. They just had a conference out in Long Beach called Act Like Men, put on by the Calvinists. Those that feel that they have been elected by God, having no choice at all in the matter. And they put this conference on to spread their propaganda to the rest of the world. It was interesting, I just read an article that Driscoll, Mark Driscoll, went to John MacArthur, who's also a Calvinist, 
He went to his conference. He just showed up there. And the guys that were leading the conference saw Mark Driscoll there. And they invited him, hey, come on in. You know, sit down with us and enjoy the conference. And so he did. Well, what he did was he went and he got copies of his book. And he actually set up a table without even getting permission for them and started to give out his book for free and signing it because he's well known, Mark Driscoll. And he's very controversial. He says the guy that likes to get at the pulpit and swear and cuss and so forth. Um, talks about <clears throat> uh, relationships very openly, married relationships and what they can and cannot do with descriptions and so forth. And so he starts signing these books and just giving out. And they're like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? It's like, well, I just got to give out some free books. And, it, and it's all on, on the church and the struggle within the church. An election and so forth. So even within their own groups, they're they're struggling with this whole thing on election. And obviously they took the books away. And he said, no, take them all. That's why I brought them for you guys to have them anyway. So they took all the books away from him. They, you know, they basically gave him the excuse that all the books that are being sold here had to go through a process and be approved before we could just sell them or give them out. And so he didn't go through that process. The word is eklek. Do is a plural adjective from the verb ek let go, which means to pick out or to select out of a number. That's the word that Peter uses here for elect. It goes all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 when it says that God elected, picked out Abraham as God's chosen people and that from Abraham he would have a number of seeds that would be produced. God has chosen us, though, as he says here, based upon what? Look at the word and highlight this and underline it. His foreknowledge that, that we would choose him. His foreknowledge. The election was based on his foreknowledge. The word foreknowledge means previous knowledge. You have to understand God. You have to know that God knows everything from beginning to end. You know that God already knows what the end is. He already knows what the end is. He already knows where you're at. He knows where you're serving during the millennium and he knows beyond the millennium when eternity hits where you're at. He already knows all that. He knows the choice. He knows where you're going to eat after this. If you're going to eat here, or if you're going to eat somewhere else, God already knows all that because he's God. So he elects based upon his pre-knowledge of what choices and decisions that you will make. It's very simple and clear. Now, Peter is the only one that uses this word. Uh, Luke uses a different word, but he makes sure that we understand that other word is different than pre-knowledge or foreknowledge he uses it in acts chapter 2 and he says this him being delivered that is jesus being delivered by the determined purpose or preordained is another word we see that in in romans preordained god is preordaining it so god does do that that is before everything was created god preordained that jesus would be taken put on a cross and die for the sins of the world that was what god did that was his plan and he implemented it without question but then he says and foreknowledge of god so there's a difference between those two words god preordains and it's done by his foreknowledge and so he preordains us who are called by his foreknowledge, knowing that we will accept the call. Now, this is where they struggle with this so bad. Well, then it's a work because you have to choose. And that is a work. And thus, so you can boast that you made the right choice. No, no, no. God gave us the choice and he knew that we'd make that choice. So then he called us because he already knew that we'd make the choice. It's not a work and we can't view it that way. We see that distinction very clear. One commentator said, God choosing is not a random, uninformed, but according to his foreknowledge, which is an aspect of his omniscience. His foreknowledge includes prior knowledge of our response to the gospel, but is not solely dependent on it. And Peter uses this word three times in this epistle to make it very clear. He uses it in in verse 2, verse 6, and also 
in verse 13 of chapter 5. Elect, elect, elect. All based upon the foreknowledge of God. The word elect is used 16 times in the New Testament. Well, how do I know I'm elected? Receive Jesus Christ into your heart. And when you receive Jesus Christ into your heart and you're born again, then you know you're elected. Well, what if I don't want to receive Jesus Christ into my heart? What if I want to reject him and not have him in my heart? Then you're not elected. Well, wait a minute. That's not fair. But that's your choice. And he knows the choice that you'll make. And so when you stand before God and he says, what choice did you make? Well, I rejected you. Well, I knew that. So I have to separate you from everyone else. Because that's a choice. You make. Wait a minute. You give me a chance. Yes, I did. Because you had a chance every time you went to church or someone spoke to you or... Believe it or not, when you were alone and you asked the question, God, are you real? Are you really real? Is there a God? And yet you did not respond to that by saying, would you show me? Would you come into my life and be my Lord and Savior? <clears throat> so God will judge us based upon our choice, but his foreknowledge, knowing what we choose now, we notice that this election is the work of the Holy Spirit because Peter says this election in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that's interesting. It's a work of the Holy Spirit working in your lives, opening up your eyes, showing you the truth, and yet the obedience that we have to come to the gospel and make a choice to obey God. That's what we would call sanctification. The word sanctification means set apart, set apart by God. God elects us based on his foreknowledge, and then he sets us apart to do a good work. And that's what most of the people are doing here in this church. They're doing good works. They're being set apart from God for God's work in his kingdom. And they are producing that work in obedience because the Holy Spirit has come into their life. I like the, the New Living Translation. It says, His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have cleansed and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Very clear. So, the result of election is sanctification and obedience. That's the process. You have been saved, justified. Now you have been, through the Spirit, sanctified. And God is working in your life. And then one day you will be glorified when we all get to go to heaven. So God the Father chooses a sinner out from among mankind to be a recipient of the setting apart work of the Holy Spirit. In which the work of the Holy Spirit sets us sinners apart for himself to do works because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that has been sprinkled and so forth. And that sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ is an is a Old Testament terminology taken from the Levitical tribes and what they used to do with the lambs as they sprinkled it. And so Peter is getting educated here. I mean, he's going back to the Old Testament. He's learning all of this stuff and he's bringing it to the Gentiles so that they can understand what is happening with Christianity. So Jesus made it possible through his blood. So now to end, Peter ends these two verses which Paul ends also. Some say that Paul stole it from Peter or Peter stole it from Paul, but Peter, Paul, whatever, you know. But they all seem to use it in different ways or places like grace to you and peace be multiplied or peace to you and grace, you know, depends on how they end their letter or their introduction. And Peter ends grace to you. He wants you to have favor from God. He desires that your life be blessed and that, Everything you touch to be a part of what God is doing in your life, causing you to grow and mature in the knowledge of God. And when you are walking with the Lord and the favor of God is on you, you have peace knowing God. They go together. You cannot have peace without grace. You just can't have it. Grace, interesting. What a way to end the study by grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Now here's an interesting thought, and I'm going to leave you with this. There is a big difference between grace and tolerance. Today we hear a lot about tolerance, right? And I'm hearing Christians using that word in Christianity too often. Tolerance. We need to be tolerant 
in Christianity. We need to be tolerant of one another. No, we need to be gracious of one another, not tolerant. We need to understand the terms and the difference between grace and tolerance. Let me define for you tolerance. This is what it used to mean when we used to use it. It made some sense. The dictionary defines tolerance as follows. Recognition of and respect of one's opinions, practices, or behavior. It's just recognizing that we're different in this world. Not everyone's going to be a Christian. And we can respect that. We can acknowledge that. That's understandable. But today the meaning is change. This is what it means today. It says, recognizing other people's right to have different beliefs and practices now means accepting and the different views themselves. Today now we have to accept it. We can't talk bad about it. We can't say it's wrong. We can say, which is, which is in relativism, is that, hey, you know, if that's what you believe and that's your faith, then that must be right for you. That's garbage. It's wrong. And so we have problems like within homosexuality where well, we have to be tolerant of them. It's not really a sin. It's they're a race, you know, like everybody else. And that's a lie. That's a lie. It is a sin. And the Bible makes it a sin. It's very clear what the results of that sin is, along with being a drunkard and other sins, too. It's very clear. But we are told to be tolerant of that. That is, accept them. Welcome them. Don't try to change them. In fact, we have laws today that says it is illegal for a counselor to try to change a young boy or a girl that has those tendencies, that he will get into trouble if he says what you're doing is wrong and we need to change you. That's what tolerance means. And we're using it in the church. Now, I'm, I'm getting a little hot here. I'm sorry. I'm going to calm down. This is what grace means. It's showing love, mercy, kindness, acceptance uh, to others regardless of their circumstances as a reflection of God, God's grace towards us. But it's not allowing a person to get away with sin. God doesn't allow us to get away with sin. Oh, he has grace on us and he could judge us right there and, and we'd be found guilty. And he continues to have grace and favor in spite of us. But he will not keep us in sin, nor does he approve the sin, nor does he accept the sin. The sin will be judged one way or another, whether it's on this earth through trials and struggles and repercussions or chastisement as a believer. God will judge us. God will punish us. God will correct us. But he has grace on us. We want grace for one another, but we don't want tolerance. And I see it in the church too often because in the church, the divisions and the struggles, you know, immediately, where's the grace? The grace is there. You're still here. You're still a part of it. What you're asking really is, where's the tolerance? Why don't I tolerate your sin? Why don't I just let it go? Why don't I just let you do what you want to do? That's sin in itself. And there's a big difference. Please understand what I'm saying here. Understand what God is saying. There's a big difference between grace and tolerance. The church is not to continue to sin. We've been sanctified. Peter's whole message is about purity, holiness, doing the right things, not living in this world. Not sinning, not being liars, not being cheaters, you know, loving God with all our heart, respecting your elders, respecting your mother and your father, you know, keeping the whole, the Sabbath holy. All those things are principles that we are to adhere to as believers. And if we don't, we're not to be tolerant. We're to call it like it is. It's a sin. And you're sinning and you need to stop because God has grace on you. He wants you to grow he wants you to mature. He wants to, you to experience everything that he has. And that comes from sanctification, a separated life from God. Big difference. So when he says grace, grace enables us to live daily with our struggles. We know we fall and, and Peter understands that grace, but he gets back up and he changes and he stops doing what he's doing and starts living for the Lord. Have you received that grace of God? The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Paul's very clear. There is grace for you. God can forgive you completely. And then he'll clean you up. He'll accept you just as you are. But he'll clean you up. 
He'll change your mind. He'll change your heart. And He'll give you a whole new direction. But you have to receive His grace. And it's amazing grace. Because He can wash it all away. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother, for the hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray.